uh, thank you all for, for coming. Um, it's good to see some familiar faces and, and meet some new faces. And um, just want to thank John for uh, our friendship. And uh, I've enjoyed getting to know him over the years. And um, I think very highly of uh, uh, Sterling and the team that they have built. And, and Doug, thank you for, for allowing me to host uh, the lunch today. Uh, very grateful. Um, one of the things that we, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about to you today, we, I gave this presentation last year at, at exactly the same time. John attended, uh, Trevor Holder attended, and it was very timely. Um, the stock market was in a, a big precipitous decline. Um, people were worried about the economy, and uh, we all know kind of what happened. We had a really good year in the market, and so I actually think today is a better time to have this this discussion and this talk than it was actually last year. Um, so here is kind of the agenda. What I'd like to do is kind of review 2019, um, walk you through kind of the, the issues uh, for the year. Then I want to really look at the economy and look at the, the hard data. I'm going to use a lot of uh, St. Louis Fed uh, public information, you know, macroeconomic data that you all can uh, access yourself. And then I have a couple charts on the presidential election cycle. Um, and then I want to talk about specifically the stock market and, and maybe how you should think about that going forward and where we go from here. And then I'll kind of give you some, some final thoughts and, and putting all the pieces together. Um, so my, my goal today is to give you a couple nuggets. You may not get everything. There's about 50 slides. But if you can get one or two things that can help you in your business, maybe make an investment decision or make a decision you know, based on a, a new purchase or a, a new uh, equipment or something that, that will maybe help you in terms of a framework. Um, a little bit more background about me. Um, I, I started my business or my individual practice about 10 years ago. We manage about $80 million of um, individual, family, and then um, you know, really entrepreneurial or business owners' uh, wealth. We help them with both customizing portfolios and then helping them make wise choices. Um, I'm a value investor, so I've structured my business um, and set up like Warren Buffett. So we, we try to make decisions based on value versus price. Um, I am a Harvard Business School alumni and I'm currently finishing my, my doctorate degree at the University of South Florida. And my dissertation research is actually on Warren Buffett. So I've, I'd be happy to talk about that afterwards if you'd like. Um, and I've published two academic papers, one on insider trading and how to use that as a tool, um, and then also on corporate brand and, and looking at a lot of stuff that Warren Buffett's done with Coca-Cola and American Express and, and how to um, look at investment decision making. So let me frame, you know, part of the, the discussion today is think about where you were in kind of the December of 2018. I was getting a lot of phone calls. People think, you know, the sky was falling. Um, this is context. Uh, October, November, and December was the worst quarter in 2018 since the financial crisis. And then specifically, December of 2018 was the worst month since 1934 in the stock market. So people were freaking out. People were worried. And the whole concept of this presentation was, you know, I was thinking um, in my office, you know, how can I explain to people that there's a dis disconnect between the economic data and the, the price of the stock market? And so that's how I came up with the presentation. You can see here, this is a chart of the S&P 500 for 2018 for the whole year. The peak was in October. We fell pretty precipitously in December. Um, and people were worried about their retirement. They were worried about making investment decisions for their business. And you, know, you all know how the, the story ends. Um, so what I try to do today was to think about what did, it, what did we experience and what type of example could this be? And I thought about the concept of a fire drill. So I really think in Q4 of 18, we had a fire drill. So think about the last time you guys experienced a fire drill. Was it in, in high school or was it in preschool or maybe when you were a professional, you know, the bell rung, you had to walk outside, wait a little bit, they did the all clear sign and, and, uh, and everybody came back. Uh, for me specifically, I remember I was eight or nine. I was 
traveling with my dad in Houston, Texas. We lived here at the time. We went and saw a, a late movie. We got back to the hotel around 10 or 11. We went to sleep, and around 2.30, the bell went off. We ran downstairs, had to go outside in the middle of the night, and, excuse me, waited and, until they said it was all clear. So I think this is a good illustration of what did happen was a fire drill. The next time could be a real fire. And then, so the question is, how will you react? What will you do? Um, the, the next message here is kind of, you know, I look at my job as an advisor is, you know, our job is to think. So we need to distinguish fact from fiction. And um, clearly, during the, uh, the internet era, there's a lot of information. Um, this is a, a blurb that Justice, Justice Chief John Roberts came out with of the risks and dangers of misinformation in the internet era. And, um, you know, the iPhone has been out for about 10 or 11 years, and this is the first kind of cycle, 10-year cycle, where, you know, we get beeped every 5, 10 minutes where the market's up 100 points, the market's down 100 points. And I, and I think it's just very disconcerting if you're a long-term investor or you're making long-term, you know, decisions for your business. Um, so, you know, our job is to distinguish, you know, truth from fiction and, and look at more of the data versus kind of the daily reactions of, to prices and fears, et cetera. So starting in 2019, uh, the odds of a recession uh, were over 25% in the next 12 months. Um, you can see here the, in, the yield curve inverted. So if you look at any classical finance textbook, uh, that meant there was a looming recession um, you know, uh, coming. After that, we had the Fed um, cut interest rates three times, and the yield curve uh, went back to a normal shape, which was positive. That drove some uh, uh, positive performance in the market and the economy. We also had a lot of private companies try to go uh, public before the market potentially closed or the window closed. We had Uber and, and Lyft and Peloton uh, all come out in 2019. And uh, they're all, their prices are all below their, their IPO price currently. Um, we had trade tensions and tariffs between the U.S. and China. Um, you can see here, it started kind of in May and then in September. Then we had our first delay in October. And then we finally had uh, some cancellations in December of 2019. And then we had four major events uh, in December of 2019. Uh, the House of Representatives impeached President Trump. Uh, the USMCA trade agreement uh, was passed with Mexico and, and Canada. Um, we had the phase one trade deal with China. I think that's nearing completion next week, I believe. And then finally, and this really just snuck in, and this is the SECURE Act, which is effective now, um, and it addresses a whole bunch of changes to IRAs and retirement plans from retired minimum distributions and other things. I have a slide uh, later in the presentation with the details on that. Um, you can see this is a price chart of, of the market for the year. Uh, we finished above 3,200 in the S&P 500, and the 10 largest companies represented about 25% of the index. So that's very similar to 1999, 2000 levels of, as, a, as a context. Um, this is the performance for the year. The S&P 500 was up about 29%, the NASDAQ was up 35%, and the Dow Jones was up 22%. Um, and those two indexes, the NASDAQ and S&P, saw their largest single increase since 2013. And then two stocks, Apple and Microsoft, which each have a market capitalization of over 1.2 trillion, um, now comprised 9% of the total weight of that index. So that's pretty remarkable just in terms of magnitude. So looking forward, um, the market's at you know, all-time highs. Prices are elevated from that bottom level, that fire drill level that we talked about. The election's in nine months, which does create some uncertainty. Um, the U.S. presidential ele election cycle could lead to changes in tax and spending policies, which could affect the path of the economy. Um, so let's kind of drill down and look at some, some real hard economic data as underpinnings. So this is uh, 
FRED data from the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank, um, and you can get this all online. It's a big database. Um, this is a chart of industrial production. Um, and as you can see, we have you know, a nice long upward trend, and we're going into the 11th year of, of the economic expansion. And I know a lot of you all are, are in the building and construction industry and, and, and have benefited from that trend. If you look at uh, real gross domestic product, uh, the economy is still growing around trend line at about 2.1%. That's still very healthy and, and it's very stable. So that's, that's very good news. This is a busy chart, but it's the fourth quarter of uh, 2019's forecast from the St. Louis Fed. They're forecasting a little slower growth for 2020 at about 1.8% GDP. Um, and they characterize the economy as fairly stable. Um, a couple of early warning signs that I like to look at. Um, this is the inventory to sales ratio. The gray line here is the last recession. And as you can see, that ratio is pretty high. And this time series is the same as this, but it's just a little longer. And so you can see in the gray, those are recessions. And so um, you can see recessions start when the inventory sales ratios are high, which is kind of where we are today. And we have very good long expansions when the inventory sales ratios are low. And so I don't know where we will be at a peak per se, but you know, we're near peak levels. And that was what I wanted to make you aware of. So it's kind of something to monitor. In addition, uh, we look at the unemployment rate, and that's at 3.5%. That is very low. Um, and if it's high, uh, you have very many years of expansion. And, then, and, and if the unemployment, unemployment rate is low, you're really no longer to able to get you know, needed people in the workforce, and you know, the expansion may be a little long in the tooth. And you guys may be feeling that today as you add new people um, they may be harder to come by, <laughs> Doug's shaking his head. Um, so this is another kind of monitor item together with the inventory to sales ratio that says, you know, trees don't grow to the sky. We're, we're not forecasting a recession, but there's several indicators that are near peak or trough um, um, values, if you will. Um, back to the tight labor market, it's uh, pressuring corporate <coughs> margins. This is a chart of operating income or operating uh, margins, you can see they're declining modestly, and so uh, wage pressure is cutting into margins for businesses. Um, corporate earnings trends are in, still in a year-over-year -year decline. Um, on the left-hand side, that's a recession in uh, 20, or 2009, and then in 2019, uh, earnings are still declining year-over-year. Earnings season starts next week, so it'll be very interesting to see what some of the larger companies report and what their sales and unit forecasts are for both the quarter and the year. The good news here is that consumer sentiment is very positive. People are pretty optimistic. The consumer is 70% of the economy, and uh, they feel pretty good about their personal balance sheet and where they are. The bad news is, is this is an inverse proxy. So you can see we're at a pretty high level here currently at 96%. Um, the highest level that's recorded is 107, but usually when the consumer is very optimistic, we're closer to a peak than a trough. And when the consumer is very negative or pessimistic at, at 55, we have a long period of expansion ahead of us. So it's very counterintuitive and, it, and it's a lagging indicator, but the consumer does still feel pretty good. So let's switch gears and, and talk a little bit about um, the presidential election cycle. I have three charts. They're a little busy, um, but these are rules of thumb, um, and they all come from the, the Stock Traders Almanac, which is an annual uh, book that you can purchase. Um, but the two rules of thumb that are most important here is the market is better when a sitting president runs for re-election, and the second one is the first five months is better when the party retains the White House. So with that as kind of a, a backdrop, um, this is the four-year presidential election cycle. That's not new news. 
but the third year of the presidential election cycle, which was last year, is usually the best year for the market. Um, this is a chart that has both the Dow Jones Industrial Average percent gain and the NASDAQ average percent gain. And you can see here in the pre-election year, uh, it's usually up about 15.8% for the Dow and about 28.8% for the NASDAQ. We had a little bit better numbers there last year. And then the election year, which is this year, 2020, uh, the average gain is much less. And then finally, on the presidential election cycle, this really shows the difference in how election years behave. If you focus on the red line, this is for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Um, if there's a city president running, usually the market's up about 10%, and that's contrasting kind of an open field, which is the jagged black line, which the market is, is down about 1.6 or 2% on average. So that's kind of some information to put in your, your toolkit in terms of how the market will uh, react potentially this year. Um, this is one of my favorite slides of the presentation. Um, this is kind of old school value line investment survey that everybody can purchase. Um, I used the chart on the left in my last presentation last year. It's the same chart and it was from January 11th, 2019. And as you can see at the time, the market was 15 times earnings, and it had 70% price appreciation potential. So in that fire drill, you knew that there was some economic stability based on the FRED data, and that you knew, excuse me, the, the falling prices, there was some upside potential in the market at the time. Today, as we speak, on the right-hand side, that was taken last week. Um, you can see the market is at 18.4 times earnings, and the three to five year price appreciation potential is only 40%. And then new to me <coughs> and new this year is Value Line put a fourth box on there, which they've never done that before. Um, and, it's, and it says basically, sorry. It says basically that uh, the market has only a 7% upside in the next 18 months. So there's a lot more risk than reward that value line is, is suggesting going forward in terms of the valuation structure of the market. So I'm comparing last year to this year from a PE and a price appreciation potential. And then uh, some of the work I did on my dissertation research, Warren Buffett um, highlights one of the best measures for the general uh, level of the stock market is the market capitalization to GDP ratio. Um, and as you can see there, um, this number is pretty high. And um, back to kind of the tech bubble levels, we're, we're, we're above those levels in 2000. And uh, yeah, 2000. So this is an annual number. I don't have 2019 uh, yet, because it comes out every year. Um, but we're, we're still elevated at about 150%. So that's another, another proxy to this chart right here. Okay, so switching gears, you know, where do we go from here? What do we do? What, you know, how do we think about our portfolio both individually and, and how should we position ourselves for retirement? Um, we've had a, a stock rotation into the value sector in, the, in Q4 of, of 2019. So you can see there the S&P 500 value overtook the S&P 500 growth, and we think that trend will continue. And then in terms of just relative valuations, uh, value relative to momentum stocks, you can see that value stocks are very attractive relative to momentum. And so potentially momentum stocks may disappoint and, and there's just a little bit better uh, value in value stocks. Uh, two sectors that I think have some merit uh, within that context are banks. Um, this is a, uh, a news article that just came out two days ago from Barron's, and they think banks are, are good bets. Uh, we like banks because they're stable, they're consistent, they have consistent dividends, they have consistent earnings, um, and, and we would kind of concur with that. Um, some of the fundamental data to back up that, that uh, call, if you will, are, are bank ROEs. They, they are rising, and this is stuff from the Fed data again, and 
ROEs are about 12%, and we think they continue to rise as deposit growth uh, continues to grow. Um, this is deposit growth year over year for the largest banks, and it, it's been growing about 5% year over year. So that's very healthy, a little bit above the economy. I want to talk about kind of retirees and, and what interest rates do and how that affects retirees. And low interest rates, we closed um, 1231 at the 10 year Treasury, about 1.9% on, the, on the, the yield on the 10 year bond. And as you can see, as rates go up, um, you have a, a $1,000 coupon bond. As rates go up, um, bond prices or par values go down. And you can have a lot of price volatility um, in, in uh, changes in rates. So, um, you know, retirees may think that they're safe and they may open their uh, account statements every month, but see their, their declining values over time uh, if rates start to rise. And I think that's a real risk in the next 24 to 36 months. And the same first principles can be applied to the general economy. Uh, the interest expense uh, in the U.S. economy can be affected the same way. Um, so our output is greater, or excuse me, our debt is greater than our output. Um, this is public debt as a percentage of gross domestic product, and you can see it's at, sort of, at a pretty high, high and elevated level. Um, there is a lot of in, uh, confusion and, and split between where the 10-year Treasury is going to go this year or go short term. Um, there's a range between 2.5%, which is going up, and between 1.5%, which is going down. Um, and I think a lot of mistakes will be made making bets on kind of you know, what the economy is going to do and how to place your bets from a, from a fixed income perspective. Um, just to give you some context, this is kind of the long-term trend line for the long bond. It's, it's a borrower's paradise today. I think it was talking to one of you today that that was thinking about making a fixed investment, and my suggestion was to try to use debt and use a fixed rate because debt's pretty cheap. Um, but you can see that the long-term pattern is between 4 and 6%. And um, if you get back to this chart, I mean, if we go above 4%, you can have some pretty vol. I mean, this could be tech stock-like volatility, potentially, if you don't hold the bond to maturity. Um, so, just wrapping up, final thoughts, um, you know, putting all the pieces together, you know, we're going into the 11th year of the economic expansion. Um, this has never gone on in the U.S. history. Um, expansions don't continue forever, um, and usually after expansions, contractions occur and, and prices fall. So, I don't, I'm not negative, but I'm very aware that trees don't grow the sky, and and you have to be forward-looking in terms of what your expectations are. Um, from a portfolio construction, I, you know, I think as, or cash is an asset class. I'll say that again. Cash is an asset class. Um, you, know, you, you all should think about setting aside some cash today at, if markets pull back uh, and you can take advantage of that pullback, sort of like the fire drill that we had in Q4 of 18. And then I would have a specific strategy this year for raising cash um, for your portfolio. So if you do it each month or you do it each quarter, but that will improve your margin of safety and kind of reduce your risk exposure. Um, I would have a value tilt this year um, and, and think potentially that some of these hyper growth companies may disappoint. <coughs> I do like banks and big energy. And then, and then finally, this is just a bigger picture is, you know, we could have a fire a real fire in 2021. And you've experienced a fire drill, and just think about you know, how you will, will react, both from a, uh, a personal investment decision and then also for your businesses. And you know, will you pull back or will you want more cash in terms of a treasure chest? Or you know, how would you like to position your business in the next 24 to 36 months? Um, so that's all I have uh, today, would love to take your questions and, and have a dialogue and um, my goal is just to kind of give you some things to think about and, and uh, have you make some wise choices uh, in the, for the next year.